You you ready? Yes, ma'am. Father God, we come this morning just thanking you. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for watching over us all night last night while we slept. Thank you, dear Lord, for waking us up this morning, blessing us to see a new day, continue life. You're a great God, a loving God, and Lord, we love you, and we just praise and honor your holy name. Now, Father God, we are now sitting in this class. We thank you for the teachers, their hard work that they, they so diligently deliver to us each week. And we just thank you, Lord. And Father God, we are praying that you be in the midst of these teachings today. Father God, we like to lift up those that are in the hospital, those that are sick. We lift up those under persecution. Lord, we pray that you comfort those that have suffered loss. And we pray for restoration with those that are sick. We honor and praise you this day. You get the glory in this lesson. We thank you for your word, for your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. In your son, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Okay, last week's lesson, a church on the move, a faithful preacher, Philip, a clever deceiver, Simon the sorcerer. And today we're doing continually with Church on the Move. <coughs> we're asking uh, Linda Gibson if she would be kind enough to read the scriptures for us. Scriptures, Acts 8, 26 through 40. <clears throat> but an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem and he was returning and sitting in, a, in his chariot and was yeah, yeah, Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture, which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter and as a lamb before its shearers in silence. So he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, in humiliation his judgment was taken away who will relate this generation for his life is removed from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, please tell me of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and began from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. As they went along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. Then he came out of, when he came out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and he passed through, and as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. Thank you very much. You're welcome. As you can see, the uh, verse 37 is highlighted, and it's highlighted because that verse does not appear, appear in most of the manuscripts. So if you have a version of the Bible, it may not have verse 37 in it. Okay, so the next reader will be Carolyn Watson, and she will read A Concerned Seeker in Ethiopia. A Concerned Seeker in Ethiopian, Acts 8, verses 26 through 40. 
Philip was not only a faithful preacher, he was also an obedient personal worker. Like his master, he was willing to leave the crowds and deal with one lost soul. The angel could have told this Ethiopian official how to be saved, but God has not given the commission to angels. He has given it to his people. Angels have never personally experienced God's grace. Therefore, they can never bear witness of what it means to be saved. D.L. Moody once asked a man about his soul, and the man replied, it's none of your business. It is my business, Moody said, and the man immediately exclaimed, D.L. Moody, it is every Christian's business to share the gospel with others without fear or apology. This experience ought to encourage us in our own personal witness for the Lord. To begin with, God directed Philip to the right person at the right time. You and I are not likely to have angels instruct us, but we can know the guidance of the Holy Spirit in our witnessing if we are walking in the Spirit and praying for God's direction. Late one afternoon, I was completing my pastoral calling and I felt impressed to make one more visit to see a woman who was faithfully attending church but was not a professed Christian. At first, I told myself that it was foolish to visit her that late in the day, since she was probably preparing a meal for her family. But I went anyway and discovered that she had been burdened about her sins all that day. Within minutes, she opened her heart to Christ and was born again. Believe me, I was glad I obeyed the leading of the Spirit. This court official did not come from what we know today as Ethiopia. His home was in ancient Nubia, located south of Egypt. Since he was a eunuch, he could not become a full Jewish proselyte, but he was permitted to become a God-fearer or a proselyte of the gate. He was concerned enough about his spiritual life to travel over 200 miles to Jerusalem to worship God, but his heart was still not satisfied. This Ethiopian represents many people today who are religious, read the scriptures, and seek the truth, yet do not have saving faith in Jesus Christ. They are sincere, but they are lost. They need someone to show them the way. As Philip as Philip drew near to the chariot, he heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. It was customary in those days for students to read out loud. God had already prepared the man's heart to receive Philip's witness. If we obey the Lord's leading, we can be sure that God will go before us and open the way for our witness. Isaiah 53 was the passage he was reading the prophecy of God's suffering servant. Isaiah 53 describes our Lord Jesus Christ and his birth, life and ministry, substitutionary death and victorious resurrection. Should be, Isaiah 53 and four should be connected with 1 Peter 2 and 24. Isaiah 53 and seven, <clears throat> Matthew 26, 62 to 63, Isaiah 53 and 9, with Matthew 27, 56 through 60, and Isaiah 53, 12, with Luke 23, 34, and 37. The Ethiopian focused on Isaiah 53, verses 7 through 8 which describes our Lord as the willing sacrifice for sinners, even to the point of losing his human rights. As Philip explained the verses to him, the Ethiopian began to understand the gospel because the spirit of God was opening his mind to God's truth. 
it is not enough for the lost sinner to desire salvation. He must also understand God's plan of salvation. It is the heart that understands the world that eventually bears fruit. The idea of substitutionary sacrifice is one that is found from the beginning of the Bible to the end. God killed animals so that he might clothe Adam and Eve. He provided a ram to die in the place of Isaac. At Passover, innocent lambs died for the people of Israel, and the entire Jewish religious system was based on the shedding of blood. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of both the Old Testament types and the prophecies. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The Ethiopian believed on Jesus Christ and was born again. So real was his experience that he insisted on stopping the caravan and being baptized immediately. He was no closet Christian. He wanted everybody to know what the Lord had done for him. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now we'll have life lessons read by Candace Brooks. Life Lessons, twenty-seven. Philip didn't waste time arguing with the angel of the Lord about why he should go. He simply obeyed. Had Philip demanded more details and spent time debating the wisdom of the command, he would have missed the opportunity to influence a high official of the Ethiopian court. Immediate obedience is always necessary. That's why it's important to spend time alone with the Lord. When he calls, you know his voice and can act directly. How did he know that believers were supposed to be baptized? Perhaps Philip had included this in his witness to him, or perhaps he had even seen people baptized while he was in Jerusalem. We know the Gentiles were baptized when they became Jewish. Proselytes, 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 converts. Throughout the book of Acts, baptism is an important part of the believer's commitment to Christ and witness of Christ. While Acts 8.37 is not found in all the New Testament manuscripts, there is certainly nothing in it that is unbiblical. In the days of the early church, converts were not baptized unless they first gave a clear testimony of their faith in Jesus Christ. And keep in mind that the Ethiopian was speaking not only to Philip, but also to those in the caravan who were near his chariot. He was an important man, and you can be sure that his attendants were paying close attention. Life Lessons 837. Philip made wholehearted belief. Philip made wholehearted belief in the resurrection of Christ, a prerequisite for baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch. In baptism, we identify with the death and resurrection of Christ and begin a new way of living in his command. Philip was called away. Philip was called away to minister elsewhere, but the treasurer went on his way rejoicing. God did not permit Philip to do the necessary discipling of the new believer, but surely he provided it when the man arrived home. Even though he was a eunuch, the Ethiopian was accepted by God. Philip ended up at Azotus, about 20 miles from Gaza, and then made his way to Caesarea, a journey of about six miles. This is, re this is referred by Isaiah. Amos had prophesied such a calamity some years before. 
and Jeremiah refers to the remnant of Ashka as though it had continued weak until his day. Until his day, Zephaniah refers to the desolation of Ashka and Zechariah to its degraded condition. It continued to be inhabited, however, for we find the Jews intermarried when with them after the after return the of Babylon. In these passages, it was called Ashtasi, as it is also in the New Testament. In the fourth century AD, it became the seat of the this this hit prick, a church district controlled by a bishop diocese. It had been destroyed. It had been restored in the time of Herod by the Roman general Gabinus and was presented to Salomon the sister of Herod, by the Emperor Augustus. It is now a small village about 8 to 20 miles north of Gaza. Like Peter and John, Philip preached his way home. As, the, as he told others about the Savior, 20 years later, we find Philip living in Caesarea and still serving God as an evangelist. Are you trace, as you trace the expansion of the gospel during this transition period, you see how the Holy Spirit reaches out to the whole world. In Acts 8, the Ethiopian was converted as a descendant of Ham where Cush refers to Ethiopia. In Acts 9, Saul of Taurus will be saved as a Jew and therefore a descendant of Shem. In Acts 10, the Gentiles find Christ and they are the descendants of Japheth. The whole world was peopled by Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And God wants the whole world all of their descendants to hear the message of the gospel. In October 1857, J. Hudson Taylor began to minister in, in, in Nepal, China, and he led a Mr. Nye to Christ. The man was overjoyed and wanted to share his faith with others. How long have you had the good tidings of England, Mr. Knight asked Hudson Taylor. Mm -hmm. One day, oh, let me do this over. The man was overjoyed and wanted to share his faith with others. How long have you had the good tidings from England? Mr. Knight asked Hudson Taylor one day. Taylor acknowledged that England had known the gospel for many centuries. My father died seeking the truth, said Mr. Knight. Why didn't you come soon? Taylor had no answer to that uh, pre, pre penetrating. penetrating question. Mm -hmm. How long have you known the gospel? How far have you shared it personally? Okay, thank you very much. Question is, how many people go to judgment without knowing the gospel because we kept it to ourselves? Okay, now God arrests Saul. He met Jesus Christ, Robin Jones. God arrests Saul. He met Jesus Christ. The conversion of Saul of Tarsus, the leading persecutor of the Christians, was perhaps the greatest event in church history after the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost. The next great event would be the conversion of the Gentiles. And Saul, Paul, would become the apostle to the Gentiles. God was continuing to work out his plan to bring the gospel to the whole world. Paul was a great man, said Charles Spurgeon. 
And I have no doubt that on the day, on the way to Damascus, he rode a very high horse, but a few seconds suffice to alter the man. How soon God brought him down. The account of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus is given three times in Acts in chapters 9, 22, and 26. According to the record before us, Saul experienced four meetings that together transformed his life. At a young age, John Newton went to, went to sea. Like most sailors of his day, he lived a life of rebellion and debauchery drunken revelry. For several years, he worked on slave ships, capturing slaves to, for sale to the plantations of the New World. So low did he sink that at one point he became a slave himself, captive of another slave trader. Eventually, he became the captain of his own slave ship. The combination of a frightening storm at sea, coupled with his reading of Thomas, a Kipsy's classic imitation of Christ, planted the seeds that resulted in his conversion. He went on to become a leader in the evangelical movement in 18th century England, along with such men as John and Charles Wesley, George Whitfield and William Wilberforce. On his tombstone is inscribed the following epitaph written by Newton himself. John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slavers in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. When he penned the beloved hymn, Amazing Grace, he knew firsthand the truths it proclaimed. Mel Trotter was a barber by profession and a drunkard by perversion. So debauched, so debauched had he become that when his young daughter died, he stole the shoes she was to be buried in and pawned them for money to buy more drinks. Mm. One night he stayed, he staggered into the Pacific Garden Mission in Chicago and was marvelously saved. Burdened for the men of Skid Row, he opened a rescue mission in Grand Rapids, Rapids Michigan. He went on to found more than 60 more missions and became supervisor of a chain of them stretching them stretching from Boston to San Francisco. One day in August 386, a professor of rhetoric named Aurelius Augustine sat despondently in his garden. Although the son of a Christian mother he had abandoned his mother's faith in favor of the Persian religion known as Manichaeism. He also took a mistress with whom he lived for 13 years, abandoning Manichism as unsatisfactory. He continued a futile search for truth. Through the preaching of the church, Father Ambrose, he became intellectually convinced of the truth of Christianity, yet he held back, perverted from accepting, prevented from accepting the faith by weaknesses in dealing with sexual temptation. Now in the midst of his turmoil, he heard a child's voice singing in Latin, tol lege, take and read. In his confessions, he describes what happened next. I stemmed my flood of tears and stood up, telling myself that this could only be a divine command to open my book of scripture and read the first passage on which my eyes should fall. So I hurried back to the place where his friend Alpheus was sitting. For when I stood up to move away, I had put down the book containing Paul's epistles. I seized it and opened it, and in silence, I read the first passage on which my eyes fell. 
not in reveling and drunkenness, not in lust or wantonness, not in quarrels and rivalries. Rather, arm yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. Spend no more thought on nature and nature's appetites. I had no wish to read more and no need to do so. For in an instant, as I came to the end of the sentence, it was as though the light of confidence flooded into my heart and all the darkness of doubt was dispelled. Delivered from a life of sin and confusion, Augustine went on to become the greatest theologian the church had known since the Apostle Paul. Church history is replete with accounts such as this, which highlight the marvelous power of the gospel to transform sinners. But no transformation is as remarkable or has had such far reaching implications for history as the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. So significant an event was this conversion that scripture records it no less than three times. Okay, thank you very much. So now we will transcend to what the Bible says about how God uses adversity to get our attention. And that's Lillian Jones. How God uses adversity to get our attention, Acts 9, 1 through 20. Any instructor will tell you that the first goal of a teacher is to raise a student's interest. You can't teach someone who isn't, who isn't paying attention. Just so, the Lord sometimes uses adversities to our life, in our lives to cause us to focus on him in a new way. That's exactly what happened to Saul of Tarsus as he traveled to Damascus, where he intended to bring great persecution upon the Christians in that city. Scripture tells us that Saul was breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. It seemed that his cruel mission nearly consumed him. But God got Saul's attention in a way he never expected. He sent him crushing to, crashing to the ground with a blazing light and instructed him to enter into into the city where there and there wait for and into the city and there wait for instructions. When he opened his eyes, he found himself blind and had to ask others to lead him by the hand into the city. Saul definitely received an, a, a, a wake up call from the Lord that day. In one stunning moment, God gained Saul's undivided attention, striking him with the adversity of blindness and humbling him in front of his traveling companions. The Lord had Saul exactly where he wanted him. Saul felt more than ready to listen when the Lord asked, why are you persecuting me? Up to that point, Saul had no idea he was dishonoring God. In fact, he thought he was serving the Lord by, writing, uh, the word, by ridding the world of Christians. A period of intense adver adversity resulted in a complete turnaround for Saul. Within a matter of days, he was proclaiming, proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues. The Lord got Saul's full attention on the Damascus road, and he used the temporary blindness and humiliation to transform the zealous Pharisee named Saul into a powerful apostle and missionary named Paul, who spread the gospel and planted churches across the Roman world. God knew exactly what he was doing when he saved Paul, and he knows what he's doing in your life through the afflictions and you face never through the afflictions you are facing never delay in responding to his call when he allows difficulties in your life seek him give him your full attention respond to his commands quickly and humbly and listen for what he has to say to you 
you will never regret giving your heart and life to the Savior. It is a it is it is it is fitting that such a unique individual would have a unique conversion. Saul was by birth a Jew, by citizenship a Roman, by education a Greek, and purely by the grace of God a Christian. He was a missionary, theologian, evangelist, pastor, organizer, leader, thinker, fighter for truth, and lover of souls. Never has a more godly man lived except our Lord himself. Saul was born in Tarsus, an important city in the Roman province of Silica. Tarsus was located near where Asia Minor and Syria met. Not far, not far from Antioch. It was most, I'm sorry, it was famous for its university. It was famous for its university, which ranked from uh, with those in Athens and Alexandria as, um, as among the most honored in the Roman world. Saul's father must have been a Roman citizen since Saul was himself a citizen of Rome by birth. His Jew Jewish credentials were equally impeccable. Like his father before him, he was a Pharisee who studied in Jerusalem under the most respected rabbi in the day, Gamaliel. Since he had apparently never met Jesus, he must have returned to Tarsus to live after completing his studies. Saul makes his first appearance in scripture in connection with Stephen. As noted in the discussion of Acts 6 and 9 in chapter 15, Saul, was, Saul may have been one of the Hel Hellenists who unsuccessfully debated him. When Stephen was executed, Saul guarded the robes of those involved in the stoning. His position so close to the action suggests he was deeply involved with the whole affair. There is no question as to Saul's role in the persecution that broke out after Stephen's death. He was its mastermind and ringleader. As noted in the discussion in L. Acts 1, 8, 1 through 3, and in chapter 18, Saul was terrifying, terrifyingly adept at persecuting believers. The Jerusalem fellowship broke up under the force of his attacks. Many of the Hellenist believers were, uh, who apparently bore the brunt of the perse persecution fled Jerusalem. As the events of this chapter unfold, child, uh, Saul is hot on the trial, on the trail of those who fled to Damascus. In his testimony to Agrippa, he articulated the fierceness of his assault. So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is, and this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prison, having received authority from the chief priest, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furious, furiously engaged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. After the interlude of chapter 8, which describes the ministry of Philip, the scene shifts back to Jerusalem. Saul, Luke notes, was still breathing threats and murdering against the, and of murdering against the disciples of the Lord. Persecuting Christians consumed him. It had become his whole life. The very air he was breathing was the, was 
that of threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. The term disciples refers to all believers, not merely the 12 apostles. Every Christian is a follower of the learner and learner from the Lord Jesus Christ. Saul wanted everyone he could lay his hands on. Hearing, the, hearing of a group of Christians in Damascus, Saul, driven by deadly ambition and twisted religious zeal, went to the high priest and asked for letters for, from him to the synagogue at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. The high priest, in his cap capacity, as president of the Sanhedrin was viewed by the Romans as head of the Jewish state. He thus had authority over Jewish internal matters such as this one. Accordingly, Saul needed letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus to have authority to apprehend Christians he intended if he found any belonging to the way, whether the man or woman, to bring them bound to Jerusalem. Damascus, the ancient capital of Syria, had a large Jewish population that is evidenced by the massacre of some 10 to 20,000 Jews in AD 66. Erd. Okay, the description of Christianity was, I mean, and this, the description of Christianity as the way appears several times in Acts. It apparently derives from Jesus' description of himself as the way and the truth and the life. The way is an, a purpose title for Christianity, since it is the way of God, the way into the holy place, and the way of truth. Having obtained the necessary papers, Saul and his entourage set out for Damascus. The normal route north and east would cause them to pass through Samaria. The, re the revival there, led by Philip, Peter, and John, may have infuriated Saul all the more. With intense hostility, he approached Damascus and the encounter that would turn his world upside down. From the dramatic story of Saul's conversion emerged seven features of, tr of the transformed life, faith, in the Savior, fervency in supplication, faithfulness in service, the filling of the Spirit, fellowship with the saints, fervency, fervency in speaking, and fearlessness in suffering. Okay, thank you very much. I have a lot of reading there. Thank okay. you so much. Okay, next we will have Melvin Townsend read The Transformed Life, which includes faith in the Savior and contact. Transformed life, faith in the Savior and contact. Amen. Uh, the Transformed Life, faith in the Savior. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. The remarkable conversion of Saul, in which he put his faith in the Savior he had been so viciously persecuting, unfolds in five phases, contact, conviction, conversion, consecration, and communion, contact. And it came about that as he journeyed 
he was approaching Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. Saul was still charging full speed to Damascus when he suddenly stopped dead in his tracks. A light from heaven flashed around him and Saul and his companions fell into the dirt. Confronted with the appearance of the blazing glory of Jesus Christ, Saul, the hardened persecutor of Christians, was speechless with terror. Luke's other accounts of this event we will find there in Acts 22, 26, fill in more of the details from Acts 22, 6. We learn that the encounter took place about noon. The light from, from heaven was not, a, was not anything but the maternal or the material creation since it transcended in brilliance even a bright Middle Eastern sun. Those who traveled to Saul heard the voice of the Lord as he did, yet did not understand the words spoken. Because the Lord's words were for Saul's ears, Saul actually saw that Jesus in glorious brilliance as he repeatedly testifies, we find those in those scriptures, while his co-prosecutors saw only the light. Ironically, the last person till then to have seen the resurrected glorified Christ was Stephen. Here is yet another connection between the ministries of Stephen and Paul. That's in chapter 15 of this commentary. It is a testimony to the power of God's grace that the man involved in Stephen's death would be the next to see Jesus Christ. Although he does not do it, do so dramatically, God always initiates the contact in salvation. As noted in chapters 20 of this volume, the Holy Spirit sovereignly arranged the circumstances leading to the Ethiopian eunuch's conversion. That was and is necessary at necessary since unbelieving men being dead in the trespass and sins cannot come to God in their own. The salvation is initiated by God is nowhere more powerfully stated than by Paul to Titus. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God, our savior, and his love for mankind appears, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So the next reader, Robin Griffiths, would read for us Conviction. Conviction. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Prostrate on the ground, Saul heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The repetition is emphatic as elsewhere in Luke's writings. Here it marks a rebuke of Saul intended to bring anguish of soul. So Saul would realize how wrong he had been and, guilty, and guilt would overwhelm him. He was one who had hated Jesus Christ without cause. Our Lord's words, why are you persecuting me? Reflect the inseparable link between himself 
as head of the body and its members. No blow struck on earth goes unfelt in heaven by our sympathetic high priest. By persecuting Christians, Saul inflicted blows directly on their Lord. Saul, who had been so violent, was violently brought face to face with the enormity of his crime, not against Christians, but against Christ. Those who go to hell do so ultimately because of their rejection of the Savior. Even those who don't persecute believers, but simply live apart from Jesus Christ, are as guilty of crimes against him as Saul was, as was Saul. As Saul himself was late, later to write, if anyone does not love the Lord, let him be accursed. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will convict men concerning sin because they do not believe in me. The crime of all crimes for which men will be eternally damned is to refuse to love and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. True salvation must include conviction of this damning sin since it is this very sin and no other that finally separates man from God. Saul knew enough about the Christian faith to hate it and persecute it. He knew the claims of Jesus and the true history of God's redemption as Stephen had preached it. He knew the apostles and their associates, Stephen and Philip had miraculous power over disease and demons. All that the spirit had laid at the groundwork as the groundwork in Saul's life. When Jesus confronted Saul, the conviction must have been overwhelming. He knew about the truth. Here, he was crushed into the dust and made it made to believe it. Life lessons. Before the apostle Paul knew Jesus as his savior, he was a prominent Pharisee named Saul and he persecuted the church. That is, he sent people who believed in Jesus Christ to be tortured and put to death. Saul honestly thought he was serving God by arresting and imprisoning dangerous heretics, religious outcasts. Yet Jesus told him that putting Christians to death, he was persecuting God himself. When we bless other believers, we bless Christ. And when we wound other believers, we, we harm him. Okay, thank you very much. So next, our reader will be Angela Williams, and the subject is conversion. Conversion. And he said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Saul's immediate response, who art thou, Lord, was a recognition of deity. He knew it was the Lord. The whole Christian gospel filled his mind negatively all the time as he pursued his passion of persecuting believers. It is not hard to believe that he already knew the answer to this question as he asked it. If not by faith, then by fear. His worst imaginable nightmare would have been to discover that Jesus was the Messiah. Christianity was true. The gospel was God's truth and he had been fighting God. When Saul heard the words, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, the light of truth was confirmed in his soul and the gospel became positive. The Christian message he knew well, having debated it with Stephen. Jesus, whom he had believed dead, was obviously alive and obviously who he claimed to be. And the Lord reminded him at that moment how pointless and painful his efforts against him were. In Acts 26 and 14, the Lord said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads, sharp pointed sticks. Saul's resistance was crushed at that moment and his heart broken by repentance was healed by faith. Philippians 3 verses four through 11 describes the mental change that occurred in his soul at this moment. 
Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day of the he of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Some have foolishly attempted to explain away Saul's experience as a result of an epileptic seizure. That explanation is inadequate, even granting the dubious assumption that Saul was an epileptic. No such seizure could account for the complete about face Saul's life took, nor does it account for the fact that Saul's traveling companions saw the light and heard the voice. For the rest of his life, Saul offered only one explanation. He had in fact seen the risen, glorified Lord Jesus Christ. This miraculous conversion without human involvement at its occurrence is an example of the extent and power of saving sovereign grace. Paul testifies to that grace in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 through 17. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, and yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. And yet for this reason, I found mercy in order that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. So our final section will be read by Lawana Withers, and that's consecration and communion consecration and communion. But rise and enter the city and it shall be told you what you must do. And the men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. And Paul got up from the ground and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. The genuineness of Saul's conversion immediately became evident. From Acts 22.10, we learn that he asked, what shall I do, Lord? Saul's surrender was complete as he humbly submitted himself to the will of the Lord he had hated. In contrast to the teaching of many today, Saul knew nothing of accepting Christ as Savior. 
then hopefully making him Lord later. The plain teaching of scripture is that Jesus is Lord, independent of any human response. The question in salvation is not whether Jesus is Lord, but whether we are submissive to his lordship. Saul was from the moment of his conversion to the end of his life. In response to Saul's inquiry, Jesus told him to rise and enter the city of Damascus and it shall be told you what you must do. Luke notes that the men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. This incident was so subject, was no subjective projection of Saul's mind, but an actual historical occurrence. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. His entry into the city was very different than he had anticipated. Instead of bargaining in, bar barging in as the conquering hero, the scourge nemesis curse of Christians, he entered helplessly blinded, being led by the hand. God crushed Saul, bringing him to the point of total consecration. From the ashes of Saul, Saul's old life would arise the noblest and most useful man of God the church has ever known. Communion. He was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. So startling and sudden had been his placing of faith in the Savior that Saul needed time to reflect on the transformation of every aspect of his life. During his three days without sight, when he neither ate nor drank, God led him through the process of reconstructing everything he was and did. Although salvation is an instantaneous transformation from, light, from death to life, darkness to light, it takes time to plumb the depths of his its meaning and richness. Saul began that process. Okay, thank you all very much. All of you did Amen. excellent in your reading Amen. and sharing. Amen. Uh, next week, will God arrest Saul? He met Ananias. He met the opposition. So that's what we'll find out the next step in the journey of Saul's conversion and becoming a witness for the Lord. Thank you all so very much. They haven't turned the recording on yet. Okay, there it is. Okay. You ready? Okay, ready. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to first say